it's been fascinating to see how much discussion and debate and intensity and passion this proposal has produced, um, at least among the legal profession. Um, and there have been lots of discussions about should this proposal happen, should this proposal not happen. Um, I think the most important thing is looking forward and figuring out how to really make this proposal work and how to assess whether it has worked as effectively as possible. What we do know is that the proposal will have different impacts on different groups of candidates. Um, many obviously will be uh, recent law graduates um, who are taking the bar in New York. Um, that will include uh, recent law school graduates from New York, but it will also include people, given the state of the New York bar, from virtually every other jurisdiction in the country. And their situation may be more complicated uh, in, or may require uh, other accommodations you know, uh, compared to New York law, stu law students. Um, in addition, though, some of those candidates um, will be people who are already practicing in other jurisdictions. Um, and uh, the question of what this will mean for practicing lawyers who are seeking uh, admission is probably quite a different matter. Um, a number of people, uh, either practicing lawyers or new graduates, will be seeking admission to the New York bar um, and other bars at the same time, and there are probably some practical considerations for them that will be different. So the answer is what we know is we've got a very complex situation here, but we really don't know until the regulations are announced and developed um, what the consequences will be. Um, one of the important and as yet unanswered questions is what um, this mandate will mean for uh, pro bono infrastructure. Um, 10,000 young would-be lawyers is a lot of people. As we've mentioned, it's a very heterogeneous population. Um, what we do know is because of uh, cutbacks in all kinds of funding, virtually every source of funding for legal services and pro bono and public interest programs around the country, and certainly that's the case in New York as well, um, the pro bono infrastructure is quite frayed and precarious. Um, there are fewer full-time lawyers who have the expertise in poverty law and other areas of law that need pro bono help. There are fewer resources to provide training, um, to make referrals, to follow up, to ensure quality control. Um, and uh, one of the really big issues um, particularly in New York, is supervision. Um, for lawyers who are not admitted to practice, um, yet admitted to practice in New York, they are required to have supervision, and it is substantial supervision. And the, the one concern is, who will do that supervision if, if you don't have enough full-time lawyers right now to handle matters and, um, and to take advantage of the pro bono resources that may be out there? Um, what will this additional uh, uh, group of lawyers um, do to that system? Um, so this could be a blessing. It could be a curse if we don't figure out how to make pro bono work more effectively and how to ensure that the public interest programs have the resources they need to provide the essential support to these, to these lawyers. The biggest concern that lawyers have, I think, in terms of doing pro bono is some people think it's time, but it's actually fear of not doing a good job. And clearly for people who have never practiced and who, I think we would all agree, come out of law school without the practical skills to do so, this could be a very um, negative experience for them. It could be an experience in which they feel they failed. It could be an experience in which they... Um, they uh, uh, experience pro bono as something that is a stressor and not a benefit. And unfortunately, the, um, the experiences and the sentiments that people um, feel around pro bono very early in their career really um, affect their lifelong um, involvement or not in pro bono. So ideally, this should be a situation in which young lawyers are exposed to pro bono. It's a positive experience for them. They understand that they're able to do it and do it well, 
and they keep doing pro bono as they become more expert and, and throughout their career, but there is the danger, if not done well, that this would have the reverse impact. The idea of, of creating uh, 500,000 more hours of pro bono through this mandate is very exciting and desperately needed. However, as I mentioned earlier, these students are coming out of law school with very little practical legal experience. This, for many of them, will be the first time that they have done hands-on work with a client. Um, they will not be familiar with the New York courts and with New York legal practices. And, and so um, the concern is that we're taking the least experienced portion of the legal profession um, and asking them to provide services that can be sometimes quite complicated to clients who can be, who are themselves perhaps less able to really help their lawyers make the case. So again, the issue of training, mentoring, supervision, um, manuals, um, matching these lawyers to the right pro bono matter so you're not stressing the system and doing uh, damage to the client is absolutely critical. I find uh, myself really admiring this proposal um, despite the fact that I do have concerns about how it will be implemented uh, for a number of reasons. Um, the first is that it really conveys to the bar in a way that gets everybody's attention, the urgency of the need for pro bono services. Um, we literally are seeing that um, an enormous number of people uh, who desperately need legal services simply are not getting that solution. And that is not only a tragedy for those individuals, but it it really is a crisis for our entire legal system. Uh, two other things I think that are really uh, wonderful. The first is that this is coming from the judges. Um, one of the things that we've seen that is really a positive outgrowth of this incredible crisis in access to justice and access to legal services has been that um, judges who in the past have been somewhat concerned about weighing in on these issues have now come forward and in many states they're leading the efforts for legal services and that is certainly the case with Chief Judge Lipman. Um, and finally, one of the things that is I think apparent to everyone, at least I hope it is, um, in this current crisis is that the situation now is so dire that we can't simply tweak what we've been doing. We literally need profound changes in our system um, if we're going to uh, address um, this issue of access to justice. And I would say based on our experience that there are a number of important uh, pieces of work that need to be done to make this proposal a reality. Um, the first is to bring together all of the impacted parties. Uh, because this proposal will not work unless there is not just buy-in, uh, but real ownership and an understanding of what the situation looks like on the ground in New York City and in other parts of the state. The second um, important thing that we found is if you're going to ask people to go to scale and you're going to um, ask them to undertake a massive increase in pro bono work, it's really important to make sure that it's that you've defined pro bono so that you're getting what you really want, you're getting what's really needed. Um, what we found is that it is possible, it is not easy, but it is possible to arrive at a definition that achieves um, the goal, and I think here the goal clearly is to provide legal services to um, low-income people and other disadvantaged clients who are not getting services. The third thing is to look at the current system and figure out how to do pro bono in that system more effectively. One of the things that we've seen law firms do in 
um, shepherding uh, large amounts of human capital is to figure out how to move from retail pro bono, placing one case after another, one at a time, in a way that creates a lot of transactional costs for the placement of cases um, and limits then the amount of pro bono work done just because that process can be so time consuming. And to move to what we would call kind of wholesale pro bono, where you're thinking about doing pro bono in a way that reduces the, um, the costs of referring and placing cases and the time required and makes it, uh, uh, makes it more likely that more people will get served more quickly. Two other things um, that I think are very important. The first is, I think, that it's really important to take a look at that infrastructure, um, even as you're thinking about transforming it and making, more, making it more efficient and less um, uh, difficult to sort of access, um, and figuring out what additional resources the public interest and in pro bono programs will need in order to make this a reality. Um, uh, there are others that can certainly help to mentor and supervise for people who already have uh, employment uh, lined up. Um, the institutions that they're going to be working with can certainly help um, uh, to do that. But the reality is a disproportionate part of the burden of making this work is going to fall on those with the least, certainly greatest expertise, but the least human capacity to make this happen. And we need to figure that out. So if you have, as the statistics indicate, a significant number of these um, uh, new law grads who are unemployed, um, where will the space be where they can meet with their clients if they're living at home or sharing an apartment with four roommates, whatever? Um, who's going to provide computer-assisted legal research for these folks? Um, they're very. Who's going to handle the insurance issue? Um, there are lots of the practical problems, and there are the resource problems of how can you stretch a diminishing number of pro bono substantive experts to address um, a, an increased number of potential pro bono volunteers, many of whom are learning the practice of law from the ground up in doing this. And then the final uh, thing that I think has to be built in from the beginning is the most rigorous evaluation possible of how this initiative has worked, what the results have been, what the outcomes have been. Um, and that includes, frankly, not just how many of the candidates met the pro bono obligation and how many clients were served, although those are certainly important figures. We do want to know about the quality of service. We want to know about the, the effect on attitudes. We want to know how well every step of the process worked and what needs to be done to make it better. New York is obviously a very important state, uh, and I think other jurisdictions are looking to New York um, as an exemplar and wondering whether they too should take on this requirement. It's very courageous of Judge Lippman and his colleagues to take that step and to try something um, and I look forward certainly to um, seeing how this plays out and, and hope that it will be something that turns out to be a wonderful new addition to the pro bono uh, community.